Assalamu alaikum rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Hope you're doing well. We're continuing our reading of Hamza Yusuf's commentary on Imam Mawalud's Mathara al Kalub. And it has been quite nerdy. Uh, it was recommended to me by a brother. I don't know if he wants me to say his name, but he knows who he is. And I've been reading it for quite some time now. We are in the section concerning anger. Let's begin. Go ahead and listen to this as you're driving, you're on the bus, you're riding your bike, cleaning your bathroom, whatever fun thing it is that you're doing. Alright. According to Ibn Taymiyyah, Muslims can deviate by way of striving to avoid God's ghadab or by way of seeking his rahmah. So we have God's ghadab. Or Rahma, mercy. They may go the way of hair splitting, a tyrannical scholar who condemns practically everyone in every act, or the way of the ignorant worshipper, as in extreme Sufism, which concludes that all is one and that everybody is going to paradise. Oh no. <laughs> Regardless of one's creed. Well, that's quite strange. We just learned something there. Everyone, oh my goodness, the creed is very important. One's disfigurement of God's revelations and one's outright fabrications about God and his nature. Yeah, fabricating things against the laws, a grievous sin. The balance is to cling outwardly to the law and carry the spirit of Sufism inwardly. Huh, carry the spirit of inwardly. Hmm. I'm not Sufi. As Imam al Shafi'i advised, so Imam al Shafi'i was Sufi? I don't know about that. When Muslims deal with one another, they should incline towards clemency and mercy, not wrath and severity. So it's sort of like a, a brotherhood, sisterhood, fraternity, sorority, alliance, wal al bara, how do they say it? God says that the former is closer to taqwa, God consciousness, so taqwa is God consciousness, than the latter, Quran 5.8. It is a more elevated act to reprieve than it is to exact justice. I don't know about that. I mean, I guess <sighs> it depends on the context and what the person has done. If someone's gone around just decapitating people and mutilating them, and then you're like, well, I'll just forgive you. You don't have to go to jail. We don't need to give you justice by, you know, putting you on death row. I wouldn't call that justice to the victims or anyone else. If it's a minor thing, I guess. But I think there's nuance, right? Imam Raghib al-Isfahani said, When love exits... There is no need for justice. What? Oh, when love exists, there is no need for justice. Well, I'd say that love prompts justice. You love someone. They destroyed your finances. They took half of your material items. You loved them. You want justice by taking them to court and trying to get it back. I think when you love something passionately, you love your you love your people, your tribe. Someone comes in and decimates your tribe. The love you had for your people, you will seek justice. Now you can sit here and say, this hippy dippy, well if they loved and the other person loved, then there wouldn't be war. But someone can love what you hate and you can hate what they love. So the mere existence of love itself doesn't mean you are going to love the same thing, nor are you going to strive for that love in the same way. Just because you love something doesn't mean it's therefore good. What he meant by this is that when love is present and is allowed to override one's anger, the demand for retribution is quieted. Well, I'm not going to love someone who did something evil. And like if your kid eats a cupcake and they weren't supposed to, you be like, oh, 
I love my kid very much, but they're going to go be in timeout. You know? I wouldn't say timeout is retribution. But what I'd say is that it's a little bit of a justice to where they get some type of punishment for what they did. If we were to look at the emotions behind the first major trial of the Islamic community after the passing away of the Prophet, peace be upon him, there was deviation from the spirit of love and cooperation. Hmm. Deviation from the spirit of love. Cooperation. Muawiyah demanded justice for the murder of Uthman. But Abi, Abi Talib, who had great wisdom, demanded forgiveness because he saw that the demand for retribution would rip the nation apart. Well, this is interesting. I, you know, who you love Uthman, and I'll be pleased with him. And they barricaded him in his house and outright killed him cold blood. So just forgiving them doesn't feel as sweet. It almost feels like a, like a, I don't know, man. There can be a point of, if it's not someone that important to the Muslim Ummah, maybe. But again, the, the, the value of a human life is, is, is important in and of itself. They were good and they were innocent. If there was an evil ruler, you know, you'd want to cause peace and try to get them to see how what you did was justified. But if it wasn't justified, you, to an injustice, you give justice. Injustice is to rectify the injustice. It's so hard to say, let's give forgiveness and everyone just move on, like nothing happened. One of their companions was butchered like an animal. Why would you just say no retribution for that? Sunni Muslims, however, maintain a good opinion of Muawiyah, contrary to the Shiites. Hmm. I don't know much about Muawiyah. We'll have to learn. Sunnis believe his intentions, like those of Aisha and Zubair, may Allah be pleased with them, were purely for the attainment of justice. Imam Ali's position, according to many Muslim historians and scholars, was actually the higher level of Islam, which is to have rahmah or mercy and clemency. Well, did they have mercy on, on Uthman when they shanked him and sent him back to Allah? Did they? You know, sometimes I feel like there really is an eye for an eye. I'm so tired of... Sometimes the word mercy gets in our exchange with pacifism. Uh, you just have to be a carpet and let everyone walk on you. Like, I don't know, man. I'm tired of it. I just see so much violence. And then the people just go to jail and that's it. And you're like, nothing happens to them besides they get jail. Something worse should happen to them. But the Constitution, Bill of Rights, all that doesn't allow cruel and unusual punishment. Because it could be misused by a tyrant. I get it. But when someone slaughters Uthman, who helped fund for the Battle of Badr, wasn't it? Battle of the Trench or whatnot. Where he helped arm the Muslims in the beginning when they were so frail. Where he married two of the Prophet's daughters. First one passed away. He remarried the second one, she passed away, and he was called the possessor of two lights. He was called Uthman the Generous, and for him to just be killed like a, a common pig, ready to be turned into bacon, is so beastly, so ghastly, and anyone involved in that should have had their head put on spikes. I don't care what their justification was for doing it. You did a grievous thing against a Khalifa. He was the Amir al muminin wasn't he? The leader of the Muslims. He was someone important. Someone of great standing. Of good character and conduct. And he was... Had his life ended in a brutal way. What we learn here is that there is a hidden hazard in inordinate demands for justice and retribution. As noted above, we have seen how this extreme position 
can lead to injustice. Extremism, in general, usually results in the opposite extreme. Our early history bears this out. For Imam Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, was a victim of injustice by those who rebelled against him out of their sense of indignation. Yeah. And if people wanted to give justice for Ali against the Umayyads who killed his son, then that's up to them. And if they want to avenge Ali's death, why not? There has to be consequences for action. You can't just be like, oh, well, they'll forgive me. They'll have mercy on me. I can do what I want. I don't really see that as wisdom. The cardinal virtues originally stem from religion. A generous person gives from his wealth to others because he is not afraid of losing his power or wealth. He knows all power and wealth are with God. All further virtues emanate from the cardinal virtues or matrices of virtues. So, a generous person, he contends, gives from their wealth because they don't fear losing their power or wealth because they know in the end that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the bestower of all the great bounty. And either way, you're going to get more bounty in paradise for the more charity that you did with sincere heart. All further virtues emanate from the cultural virtues or matrices of virtues. Mercy, for example, issues from wisdom, hikmah. Okay, so he contends mercy is highly related to wisdom, hikmah. Since forgiving someone when you are wrong requires a recognition of the greater wisdom in remission and the greater good in clemency. Yes, but there's also wisdom in not forgiving someone as well because they'll perpetrate it again. Look at the criminal justice system where they're like, okay, this person's committed six crimes. Let's just forgive them again. Let them back out on the street. And the person comes back, they did a more heinous crime. Sometimes not forgiving is wisdom because the person isn't going to change. They're a liability to society and they are monsters and should be put down as such. Thieves and whatnot. You know, there's some people who you can forgive in your heart, but you never forget and you keep them at a distance and have a permanent stigma for them. If a drug addict lies to you over and over and over, they steal, they steal your credit card, they steal your cash money you had in your wallet, you have a nice watch, they pawned it, and they're just like, oh, forgive me, forgive me. You know, and you're like, sure, yeah, I'll just have mercy on you and let you keep doing it. That person will take advantage of your mercy and use your mercy as a weakness and a wedge in order to undermine you. I think there's a balance, this idealistic way of always having wisdom that leans towards forgiveness and mercies, leaves out the wisdom of war of knowing evil when you see it, when something is beyond repair, and when you're supposed to walk away. That's what I'd say. What do you think, fam? It's quite a unique section, I have to say. The book always gives me something to think about, which I appreciate. That's why I like doing this book review and textual analysis of it, because it really does get us to think and do introspection, which is fun. And we are more than halfway through when I compare the two wedges so we've gone quite deep into this book for some time let me know what you think